You live uh, just right up the hill. Tell us what happened. Well, the smoke just got really bad, so I just started packing up all of our stuff, and we got in the car to go. Um, and then all the cars were abandoned, so I had nowhere to go. So I just had to get out of my car and start walking. The smoke is so bad. I don't. I have no idea where we're going. This mother and her dog and her child were able to get help, so don't worry about that. But what stood out to me in what she was telling us here in her story is how she had to abandon her car because there were so many other abandoned cars on the road. And if you're watching this after this round of fires is over, you might be wondering, why did all the petrol heads out there use this opportunity to attack electric vehicles during this time? Check out this clip. He's seemingly just showing an EV charger, a very small EV, Electrify America charger, with a bunch of people waiting in line. And that has led to really dumb headlines like this popping up, pushing this narrative that EVs are bad in these situations. But I can already see your eyebrows start to raise. Yes, there's more to this story. With the absolutely terrible fires in Los Angeles, I think we need a reminder of why EVs are hopeless in the event of a natural disaster, especially bushfires, because the first thing to fail is invariably the electricity. Unlike a jerry can full of petrol in the garage for an emergency, you can't keep a jerry can full of electricity in your EV. So if it's out of juice and there's a power cut, good luck getting yourself out of danger in a hurry. And the public charging stations will either be out of action or jammed full. So yeah, you know where this is headed, right? I'm not going to go through point by point with this guy here um, because I honestly feel bad that he's incapable of scrolling past and clicking on even one additional link to understand what the facts of the situation are. But we're really all subject to this behavior as built into our DNA, unfortunately. So unless we do our due diligence and try to find the real facts and data behind these stories, you and I both could be just like him, parroting oil industry propaganda for clicks on the internet. But first, let's talk about these fires to get a sense of where they're at as of this recording. And don't worry, I'll get back to that original clip of the people waiting in line to talk about that in a second. I talked to a fireman once. He goes, dude, one day, he goes, it's just going to be the right wind and fire is going to start in the right place and it's going to burn through L.A. all the way to the ocean. And there's not a fucking thing we can do about it. <laughs> I go, really? He goes, yeah, we're just we just get lucky. He goes, we get lucky with the wind. Jesus he goes, but if the Christ. wind hits the wrong way, it's just going to burn straight through L.A. And there's not going to be a thing we can do about it. Because these fires are so big, dude. When they, they're talking about like thousands of acres that are burning simultaneously with like 40 mile an hour winds. And once it happens, it happens in a way where it's so spread out that there's nothing they can do. Now, that's a five month old Joe Rogan clip where he's basically predicting the current situation here in L.A. with the fires. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but if we blamed COVID on Bill Gates after he predicted it years earlier, maybe we can pin the whole situation on Joe Rogan. What do you guys think? No? Okay, fine. Each natural disaster has its own unique challenges, of course, but there are kind of three things that always seem to pop up when we have a natural disaster situation, whether it be a hurricane or, in this case, fires. The first, of course, that our smooth brain subject pointed out is power outages. So when you have natural disasters like this, the grid often goes down or they even intentionally shut it off to prevent additional problems like additional fires from down power lines and other situations like that. So this can be life threatening for some people that rely on medical devices to keep them alive. And it may sound sort of like a niche case. But besides that, just remember that out here we use electricity for pretty much everything from heating and cooling, communications, refrigeration, and oh yeah, pumping gas at gas stations as well. And that brings us to today's sponsor, EcoFlow. I've been using EcoFlow products for years, and they've completely transformed how I manage energy in my off-grid recording studio that I'm in right now. From powering my gear to keeping everything running smoothly, EcoFlow has been my go-to for reliable and innovative solutions. And now, with their latest release, the EcoFlow Oasis, they've taken energy management to another level. Oasis isn't just a product, it's a comprehensive energy management system powered by AI. It gives you full control over your energy, from real-time monitoring to automating usage based on your needs and local conditions. Imagine setting your power system to prepare for a storm before it even hits, or optimizing your solar energy use without lifting a finger. Whether it's powering my recording studio or managing energy from my home, the EcoFlow Oasis system combines sustainability, cost efficiency, and total energy independence. It's 
easy to use, fully customizable, and works seamlessly with EcoFlow's portable power products and other smart devices. If you're ready to take control of your energy future, whether at home or off the grid like I am here, the EcoFlow Oasis is the solution you've been waiting for. Discover smarter, simpler energy management today. You can learn more at the link down in the description, and thanks EcoFlow for being a longtime partner of the channel. Now let's get back to the video. But if you do have an EV, this is where things get even better. So many EVs actually have electric outlets just built into them, and they actually pull from the EV's battery, which can range from, I don't know, 60 kilowatt hours up to 130 kilowatt hours, meaning you could have days of power for things like your communications and your fridge and whatever else you might need to power. Here are some examples, like in the bed of my Rivian, where you have a couple as well as a few other places in the Rivian. You can just run an extension cord from that. Other EVs come with adapters like this Hyundai Ionic 5, which also is the same as a Kia EV6, where you plug this thing into the charge port and it just gives you a regular outlet you can plug stuff in. And then of course, there's the biggest, most badass option, which is when you're able to power your entire home with your EV. And we saw this recently recently in Florida with Hurricane Helene and Milton, where there was a vet clinic that had lost power. And they are kind of an emergency services because during these situations, people are going to need to take their pets and, you know, get them cared for. So along with millions of other residents, this vet clinic had lost power during that time, which could be life threatening for a lot of those animals there. And beyond that, other EV companies are getting on board like Kia with their EV9 and a fully integrated system that will just automatically switch over to your car's battery if the power goes down, or even you can have it be scheduled where it's using it to sort of do this rate arbitrage thing. But in any event, you can have solar panels that refill that battery and then that battery powering all of your things if you're able to afford this and you have a home and all those kind of conditions are right. So in a situation where there's a natural disaster and the grid is down, EV owners have a definite leg up on gas car owners, which most gas cars have nothing like this and certainly can't be just refilled by solar panels on their own roof. You have to go get gas. And as we know, that can be a real issue during a time of crisis. And this was illustrated really well by my friend Kaz over at Cyber lift when hurricanes Helene and Milton kind of ravaged Florida there and he was able to find electricity no problem but people had to wait hours for gas and then were eventually turned away when they ran out the line for gas and it extends to my left here at this well uh, wow there's another line over here <laughs> goodness and here's more of the line to my left meanwhile I'm gonna refuel here in about 20 minutes. I'm gonna go save some more people in Tampa. But wait, wouldn't the superchargers be down as well? Good question, and it depends. But if we look at the LA fires, here's how many superchargers we're talking about. And yes, these are just for Tesla here, but a lot of these are open to other EVs as well. And almost all EVs in the US can use Tesla superchargers, or some of them anyways, if you have an adapter, which means that there are hundreds of choices here. Then this brings us to the third element that most natural disasters share, and that's evacuation. Most new EVs in the United States offer upwards of 300 miles of range, far more than you need to escape and get out of harm's way. And when sitting idle, let's say you are stuck in traffic trying to get out there, even in extreme cold, they hardly use any power at all. And this is one of those big myths that a lot of the petrol heads out there in smooth brain media like to, like to spout off is that if you're sitting there in an EV, it's gonna lose power because the battery is just you know eating up so much energy. But in fact, it's the opposite. EVs use far less power than gas cars do just to keep them idling because essentially the motor is doing nothing, it's off entirely. Whereas your gas engine is running regardless because it has to run in order to power basically everything in your car. And from a few years back when they started doing this energy comparison, one guy was able to show that it only took 500 watts of energy on average to keep his car at his desired temperature. That's 500 watts to keep the cabin at the temperature you want. And then there's an 80,000 watt hour battery that you're sitting on. So. You do the math there and you would have approximately 160 hours or over six and a half days of heat before you ran out of juice. But of course, if you're sitting in your car for nearly a week, you're going to have much bigger issues than whether or not it's warm, notably, you know, food, water, and a bathroom. So if you're stuck in traffic trying to evacuate from a natural disaster, an EV is absolutely the best choice. It's going to keep you warm and take you out of harm's way, would give you plenty of room to transport you and your family to somewhere safe. But that brings us to that original clip that we started with. I've lived in Malibu. 
Malibu my whole life and I've seen tons of fires. This is nothing. I was I'm scared for my life. It was it's terrifying. So well, we're glad that you're safe. We'll get you down there. Thank get you. Some help. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you. The issue we often see in natural disasters with evacuations has nothing to do with the vehicle being combustible or electric. It's with people abandoning their cars in the middle of the road blocking access for emergency services or other people looking to get to safety. And this is actually what our smooth brain subject we started with earlier highlighted in his thumbnail of his video. And of course, it might seem obvious, but when the majority of the cars on the road in an area are electric and you are asked to abandon your car, you'll have a bunch of electric cars left behind. It's correlation, not causation. Yes, people were abandoning their cars at the request of emergency services, not because of an issue with the car at all. And as we look through some of these photos here, you can see that there are tons of different cars, electric, gas, whatever. So... The idea that they were abandoned because they were electric is just pure disinformation. That's just a flat out lie from these smooth brain pundits out there. So if you're ever in a situation like this, definitely make sure that you have an EV so you can easily charge up without waiting in lines for gas. And you could also potentially power your home if you're sheltering in place. And if you do need to evacuate, your EV can easily handle the traffic while staying warm in colder climates for far longer than a combustible vehicle can. And if you found this helpful, here's another video that you have to go check out talking about how EVs helped people in the last round of hurricanes in Florida. Go give it a watch. And members, I'll see you backstage in a few. That's it for this one, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments, and I'll see you back here next time. And stay safe, everyone.